Okay. So welcome to Like and Like, the new show uh, by Product Camp, uh, where we speak to our uh, guests and, uh, and speakers. And uh, in this episode, I'm talking to Eric Rice, my, my good old friend and our friend at Product Camp, uh, who's been with us since the beginning of the event. Uh, welcome, Eric. Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. So are we speaking Polish today? Or? Oh, probably not. My Polish is not very good. I can order a beer and I can order vodka. And that's <laughs> All right. Okay. We can probably practice that during the event. That sounds um, like um, before we maybe delve into serious questions, um, so what's, what's, what's happening in Copenhagen these days? Uh, mm-hmm. What are you up to? Ooh, what am I up to? Well, I have a week and a half before I go to Chicago to uh-huh. attend the 19th edition of the Information Architecture Summit. Wow. And uh, happily this year, I do not have to present anything, so I can actually attend sessions and just enjoy being uh, being with other people in the community. I, I find that, and this will get into the questions that you're probably going to ask later, uh-huh. Machik, and that is that... A lot of the sessions that I see at various conferences are things that I've seen before, uh-huh. and some of the most interesting conversations take place at the bar. I think that people think <laughs> I probably drink more than I do. I, I, I'm really, I'm pretty careful about these things. But that's that's where people let their hair down. They they mm-hmm. don't have to perform. They don't have to worry about their powerpoints. Yeah. And um, uh, that's. That's a very interesting experience. So dinners and socializing and the breaks and meeting in the bar after the conference. Yeah, these no, are that's, for, that's for sure. That's for sure. And, and I definitely share the same experience. I, I mean, it's not that I don't discover new things at conferences. I, I still do. But as someone said before, and I think you said that before as well, one of your presentations that, you know, another day, what we do uh, these days is not really creating anything new. We are just rediscovering same tools and methods that people before us um have have discovered it on the run so so it's it's really nothing no, nothing really that novel maybe our products are new or interfaces are new but really the tools are the same okay so uh, coming coming to the first question uh, what what is uh, what is that one thing that you have uh, recently discovered it can be anything uh, from within the industry uh, a new tool a fad um, anything really that that you really like that I really like mm-hmm. <coughs> I've found no new tools and no fads or anything that I'm particularly in love with, to be perfectly frank. Uh, I think that there are some trends in our industry that I absolutely applaud. Uh, I uh, absolutely adore the fact that we're starting to think more about diversity and to get minorities into the community and so on. Uh, Fat Ducks and uh, Design It in Munich are co-sponsoring a minority woman Mm -hmm. from a university in the United States to attend the IA Summit. Uh, I think it's very important to get more people involved. And what worries me a little bit is that sometimes our community tends to be a little haughty. that, uh, oh no, but we know this, or I have a certification in in user experience, or Mm. whatever. And as far as I'm concerned, we're all doing user experience, uh, one way or another, whether we call it user experience Mm. or not. The people who uh, emptied the trash in Gdansk or Gdunia uh, don't think of themselves as being part of the user experience team of uh, Eastern Pomerania, but they are. Uh, They're keeping the city clean, and... and, uh, I think we need to take a broader view. There's still too many companies that think of design as uh, pushing pixels on a screen, and uh, we need to move beyond that. Uh, design and user experience are very, very broad topics. Uh, but to get back to your question, I th- the the, ten- the trends that I like are, first, that we are finally talking about the ethics of what we do. Mm. This yeah, is okay. something that I've been preaching for years and years. As a matter of fact, uh, I've only been fired twice in my life, and the last time was because I bitched about the ethics of the agency at which I was working. Uh, I think that the understanding of morals and ethics, and there is a difference, is not clearly understood, and 
now people are starting to talk about that, and I think that that's important. Uh, uh, certainly the Me Too movement has, has spurred some of this on. We are trying to be more inclusive. We are trying to be diverse. But we're also starting to think about forms design, very basic things. You know, are we actually doing something good, or are we bringing, introducing a cognitive bias to our work that in some way um, belittles a community? It can be uh, uh, minorities, or it can be based on gender or religion or whatever. Uh, we're starting to move beyond that, and I think that's that's a very, very positive, uh, positive thing. Hmm. Uh, uh, also, we're certainly in Europe starting to talk more about privacy, and uh, again, this is something that I've been railing about for years, and nobody really listens. Now, privacy is Article 7 in the EU Constitution, uh, it is not one of the rights afforded to Americans. And Americans have a tendency to say, oh, well, we don't really care. And yeah, we know we have to give away information because mm. we're getting Facebook for free or whatever. Uh -huh. But I don't think that they fully understand that uh, losing your privacy is like losing your virginity. What's gone, it's gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and you take one of these silly name tests on Facebook, and somebody is collecting a lot of personal data about, about mm. you. Now, I have nothing that I personally have to hide. There's nothing, nothing dark in my past, nothing that I won't talk about publicly. So I'm not particularly concerned about that. But on the other hand, uh, there are certain things that are really nobody's business. And I, I, I'm afraid that, that while we are starting to talk about privacy and we're talking about net neutrality and other things, that there are still too many people that yeah. are giving away things that they may regret yeah. at, at some, some future time. For, for sure, like the ethical thing you've mentioned before, it's definitely you know, a huge area, it's a very broad area, and uh, I, I definitely agree that something we should be discussing. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe, you know, we'll have time to discuss it uh, at Product Camp as well. Um, recent, not sure if you've, if you've read that, Mike Montero wrote an article about ethical things like he he often writes about ethics but uh, in this case he he was advocating for designer licenses what do you think about that should designers need licenses uh, it's an interesting question I, I I'm not sure that that's the way to go I, I think though that when you are on a a design team that you have a responsibility to speak up if you think that something is being done that mm -hmm. uh, that that maybe isn't that right. violates rights. Uh, or, or, yeah. that, that, well, the, the thing is, we make a lot of decisions that uh, we don't know what the long-term consequences are, mm. and uh, so these discussions can be very difficult. But certainly, I have been in situations where. Uh, we've had a client that's asked us to do things that I've simply said, no, I'm sorry, we won't do that. Mm -hmm. I think it's wrong. Uh, the tech community has a tremendous amount of power, and it's our job to use that responsibly. Yeah. Now, in terms of licensing people, I don't know that uh, licensing is sort of you know, a black and white thing. Oh, I have a license, so it's okay mm -hmm. that I do mm -hmm. what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, but the world is not black and white. It's not binary. It's not right and wrong. Uh, all of these ethical and moral discussions enter a gray zone and it's very, very difficult to say what is right and what yeah, is wrong. Yeah, yeah. Most definitely. Eric, and coming back to, to the second question of the show, what you particularly dislike or what you hate these days? Ooh, I, I have a long list. All right, okay, <laughs> cool. Let's get to that. <clears throat> well, <coughs> excuse me. I get irritated when suddenly, because I happen to be using a smartphone, some service, Facebook or something else, insists that I download their app because that'll be better. Yeah. I don't understand why they want me to download their damned app. Yeah. Uh, that that bothers me a great deal. This should be a seamless experience. And they're trying to mm. channel me into things that I don't necessarily like. Okay. Um, the other thing is that there are, unfortunately, a lot of 
user experience charlatans out there. Martina Mintz, a, a brilliant Bulgarian woman living in Berlin, has a terrific presentation about this. She's trained as a psychologist and says, look, there are a lot of fakes out there. And the problem is, and this gets back to licensing. Oh, well, I have a license, so that means that I'm good at what I do. Or I have certification, that means I'm good at what I do. I'm not sure that that's really the case. And we see a lot of what uh, a woman by the name of Spider Girl on Twitter has named UX Theater, where consultants are called in and they, they hold a workshop and there are lots of stickies on the wall, but basically the client doesn't care. They are... They're, they're putting on a show to justify their existence, mm. but they're not really going to use this information in any way. This is also one of the reasons that I personally have turned down any number of uh, uh, governmental organizations, because they're not really interested in doing something for the users. They just they want, want, a sticky, fat, yeah. they want a big fat report that says, mm. oh, yeah, all right, mm. so we, now we have, we have a report. It's all mm. wonderful, but they don't do anything about it. Mm. And uh, there are things that I can't really talk about mm, because mm, I have NDAs, sure. uh, but, uh, but I find it very unpleasant, this whole idea of UX theater. And a lot of that is being practiced. Part of that has to do with the fact that a lot of companies don't truly understand what UX is. And I think that if our community has made a mistake, it's that they have not been successful in communicating what user experience actually brings to the bottom line. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of product teams that say, well, hey, uh, it would be really cool if we build um, uh, build something that does X. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, it's, it's hit or miss. Maybe they'll, they'll, they'll be successful. The chances are they won't. This happens to a lot of startups. Somebody is very enthusiastic about a, an idea. It's probably a lot better. No, not probably. It is a lot better to say, wouldn't we will solve X for this group of people. Then you have a product that will sell. Mm. And that will affect, uh, uh, give an effect on the bottom line. And there are too many companies that just sort of go off and they, oh, well, let's mm. develop this, let's develop that. It's not a good tactic. But because of the user experience, the community has not been very good at, at, at explaining that it's not just a question of you know, putting lipstick on a pig and pushing some pixels around and making things a little more usable or a little more this, that u user experience is much broader than that. Because the companies don't understand that. They think, all right, yeah, well, we've got a user experience team and we did this workshop, so everything's good. Mm. And it isn't good. Mm -hmm. So outcome matters more than the theater, in other words. Excuse me? The outcome matters more than the theater, uh, than the process. Oh. No, absolutely. Uh, 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 but but the theater is what people, what the companies see, mm -hmm. and uh, and they think that that's good. But the, you're absolutely right. It has to be the outcome. I can buy the greatest ingredients in the world to cook a meal, but if I'm not a good cook, it's not going to be a good meal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on, the other, on the other hand, you can you know be a good cook and have really mediocre. Uh, ingredients and really cook up a, a, a great feast out of that. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. exactly. Anything else on your on your list? Well, I, I think that our community, because of fashion du jour, has also uh, certainly in terms of graphic design taken a step backwards. We have all these WordPress templates that people love, and basically what you end up is with a long page of text and a hamburger menu that is not even a menu to separate pages, but just page anchors leading down to something further down mm -hmm. the screen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I think back to 1995, and we had these long gray pages uh, of text with some page anchors at the top. And as far as I'm concerned, it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. But what happened the last 23 years that we didn't learn this? I, I'm amazed that we keep making the same mistakes again and again and again. There are things that we have learned uh, uh, or should know, but we're not necessarily practiced. On the other hand, Eric, my, what you're describing, uh, that anchor thing, might be just a, a realization that it's coming back to the roots or coming back to simplicity, because that, I mean, w whether we like it or not, but that's fairly simple, yeah? You have a menu at the top and then you just anchor down. I mean. 
Well, sure, and and I've I've had a, a theory for years. I have absolutely no, 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 uh, nothing other than my empirical observations to draw on. But when I was in advertising, I wrote a lot of annual reports for big companies, and some of these were listed on the Nasdaq and the New York Stock Exchange, uh, uh, the DAC, the Cat Carang. And there were very, very specific rules for how you wrote one of these annual reports. Well, they all ended up being about 40 pages or whatever was divi divisible by 16 because that's a signature when you bind a book. And the truth is you could tell a lot about a company in those 40 pages. And I wonder why so many companies think that they need to have 900 pages mm. of prep. Now, I'm not talking about Amazon that has two million pages of books, because this is homogeneous information. The number of te page templates they have is really very, very limited. And I think the companies might do well to back up and think a little more about uh, where they're putting their money rather than you know, changing the design of their buttons. Maybe they need to be focusing and removing content that nobody is reading anyway mm. and focus on improving the content that's there so back to likes and dislikes the fact that uh, there are so many good content strategies out there uh, Carrie Hain, Rahel Bailey others who uh, are, are really working hard to sell the concept of good content to uh, to 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 product and business owners, I think is a very very good thing. And rather than invest a lot of money in a new CMS or whatever they do, just take uh, yeah. take take a big CMS like Sitecore. Uh, I think the license alone runs a couple of, what twenty thousand euros a year. Mm. Well, if you put twenty thousand euros into better content, mm. you're probably going to be better off yeah. than uh, than than buying a product that you. Uh, that you don't necessarily need. Yeah. I think Sitecore is a wonderful product, and um, it, in, <laughs> for open disclosure reasons, I should say that I was for a short period of time chairman of the board of Sitecore. <laughs> but uh, but the truth is, most companies don't need the facilities that Sitecore yeah, offers, yeah, yeah, sure. and their money would be better off spent on, for example, content. I was thinking of this the other day because I read an article on on the internet that, oh, you should never buy one of these sets of 36 kitchen knives, fancy kitchen knives, and six steak knives, and whatever. And uh, I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. Um, and it was a good article. And I went down, and I dragged out all the knives in my kitchen, and I had 14 of them plus six steak knives. And the interesting thing is <clears throat> that there are really only three knives that I use on a daily basis. The others are for very specific purposes. It can be an oyster's knife, or it can be a knife for, uh, for shaving off uh, thin, uh, thin pieces of lox from half a salmon. Uh, the thing is that knives are not like screwdrivers. You can go out to your local hardware store and buy a big set of screwdrivers, and the tool works the same way. You, t you put it in the, in the slot and you twist it. There's not a lot to learn, but each individual knife requires a special skill. And uh, uh, the same applies to CMS systems. I don't think most companies are willing to invest the time in training that's necessary so they can yeah. actually get the maximum value. I think, I think Eric, you, you touched on a, on a very interesting thing, that is uh, dumping of content and uh, saying goodbyes to old things. Uh, uh, in, you know, obviously, in, in, in the sense of uh, content, that's very important, but that, that's also important, I think, in, in terms of uh, functionality. Uh, sure. And I, I think that that lends itself to you know a talk or, or, or a book even, like how to get rid of old things in UX, either content or functionality. And I, I'm sure that's been you know there's been stuff written on it, but anyway. Um, and finally, Eric, um, my favorite question, and that is, what is that one thing that you strongly believe in? Uh, that might not be that obvious to your colleagues in the industry? Uh, 
Well, all right, there, there are two things. Uh, the first is that we have to understand that this is a young industry, and we are making it up as we go along. Despite the books, despite the, the, the design patterns and all this wonderful information that we've gained over the past 25 years, we are still making it up as we go along. Now, we're not making the same mistakes, uh, always, that we were 10 years ago. And the things that we do today will probably look kind of silly in 2028. Uh, we think that, oh, well, you know, we read a couple of books and that'll make us a UX expert. That No, it doesn't. Uh, just sticking to design patterns does not necessarily make it a usable or a worthwhile site. Uh, so... I think that we need to be a little humble. We also have to respect the fact that there are other industries that have been along for a long time, industrial design, service design, and so on. These are not things that were invented by the UX community. And there is information from other sources that I'm not sure that we're looking at uh, at least as seriously as we should. Such and us? the other Well, I mean, service design in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, is service design... Uh, uh, people have been talking about that since the 1920s. There was a, a, a lot of work done, uh, uh, particularly in the 1970s and 80s. And these are things that we can learn from and improve upon. But um, to say, oh, I'm, I'm a service designer, <laughs> without knowing who John Scholl is or... Uh, or Ray Considine or the other Phil Crosby, the people who who were pioneers of that industry, I think that's a problem. You just made me. And, you just made me look up John <laughs> Crow uh, and Phil we, Crosby. Uh, if we, uh, yeah, total quality management. He was very mm. cool. I, uh, mm, right. I got to know a lot of these people back in the '80s when I was working on service design, and but unfortunately, most of the UX community doesn't know. Um, about them and I think that it's wrong for us to think that we've invented this there mm. is a body of literature the other thing is uh, if we look at how difficult it is to sell the concept of user experience it uh, would be worthwhile for people to read for example Henry Dreyfus's book um, designing for people from mm. 1955 mm. because the things that he and Raymond Lowy and Brooke Stevens and the other industrial designers who were pioneers of their industry in the 30s and 40s the things they went through trying to convince clients that a well-designed product sold more mm. are exactly the same problems yeah, true. today and there is stuff to be learned mm. yeah. and then the other thing that I that 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 always disappoints me. Again, there are things that we've known for 25 years that are still not being practiced. That is the whole concept of establishing a shared frame of reference. I was uh, I was signing up for a conference uh, that had a lot of pre-conference workshops. And uh, I looked at the workshops and I said, well, that's interesting, but I also have some private errands in that particular city. Uh, when it, it, are these half day, are they full day workshops? Which day is it going to be? Mm -hmm. And the only way you could figure that out was to actually go to the registration form. Oh, now, mm -hmm. this is basic information that yeah. should have been associated with, uh, uh, with the description of the workshop. And these are very serious practitioners that have put this site together. And yet I wonder, why is it that we haven't yet learned some very, very basic things mm -hmm. about creating the shared frame of reference? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Why yeah. do we take so many things for granted? That's one. Thank you, Eric. You, you have definitely made me uh, maybe want to buy a stack of books on total quality management and uh, good old stuff, um, or, or undust these things from my from my bookshelf. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, thanks for the conversation. Uh, we'll be wrapping up. Uh, looking forward to catching up again uh, in Gdynia uh, in June, uh, Eric. So um, many thanks and have a great day. What? Final Before comment. Before we go, yep. Shared reference. If we talk about the Tri-City area, we know we're talking about Gdynia, Southport, and, and Gdansk. If you're in Texas and you talk about the Tri-City area, they're going to think it's Dallas, Fort Worth, and Addison. Hmm. Uh, creating that context yeah. is incredibly important for creating that shared frame of reference. And I think that this is where a lot of content goes wrong and a lot of product owners go wrong when they're trying to explain what it is they've created. 
Sorry, just a little. It's fine. Shared frame of reference. Got it. Thanks, Eric. Cinquia. Cinquia. Dovizinia. Have a great day in Copenhagen. Is it snowing there? Uh, a little bit. Not much. Okay, that's good. See you soon. Okay. Magic. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.